our community benefits from being a MORPSI member, not only by the networking opportunities, but the access to subject matter experts that are on the national and global level. All levels of the MORPSI team are easily accessible and very helpful to us in our planning processes. MORPSI is helping our city by coordinating essential research as we prepare for the wave of demographic changes coming to our communities. We live in the fastest growing region in the Midwest. Change and opportunity are all around us. State and federal legislation have a significant impact on the level of local government resources that we can provide to our community. MORPSI's advocacy updates put us in a position to be able to act quickly and have an effect on the process early. MORPSI partnered with our community to leverage local dollars with federal dollars to speed up improvements to a major interchange directly benefiting traffic flow in the region as well as safety and air quality. It's the new ideas that we find refreshing and adaptable. MORPSI makes sure communities benefit by gaining access to good modeling tools as we decide how best to use our existing assets. Pilot Township leverages our MORPSI membership by taking advantage of the local government summer internship program. That allows us to place an intern into our public service department. Our involvement in MORPSI has inspired us to set aspirational goals for the improvement of our city. The number of older residents is growing. There are now more millennials than there are baby boomers. And we are becoming more racially and culturally diverse. One of the great things about MORPSI is that they've become a trusted regional collaborator. And as part of that, through Competitive Advantage Program, they are representing the region with infrastructure issues and projects that we want to move forward in the future. Whether it's transportation, energy, data, or better growth strategies, we work on innovations that connect us. And Central Ohio's communities need those tools and resources to get ahead of that growth. So good morning. Welcome to the 2017 Morpsey State of the Region. I'm William Murdoch. I'm the Executive Director of the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, also known as Morpsey. And I love the energy in the room. I love the energy we had in the hallway. And I tell you, I love that video too, because it features our members talking about how we're all working together to improve the quality of life. So I know we have a lot of Morpsey members in the room, but if you didn't know it, Morpsey has over 60, 60 local governments and regional organizations in the Central Ohio region. And working together with them is what we're all about. Working to make our region a better place, that's what we're all about. And in that video, what I love is seeing all that up close, seeing the members talking about uh, the smart tools and the hard work that they use, and I just think it's, it speaks a lot to what we're all trying to do here. So thank you for being uh, a part of today's event. And I need to tell you that I'm so proud of our Morpsey team for their work on this event. Let's give our Morpsey team a round of applause. You can depend on Morpsey for what we've always done for Central Ohio. We bring the region together. We get ahead of growth. We have smart tools for you in data, transportation, sustainability, and so much more. And I need to tell you that we're very fortunate that we're in a growing region and we're in a changing region. Morpsey's proud to be your resource for that as we grow. And so here's where it gets fun. We are growing. Since 2010, Central Ohio has added 140,000 people, which means our population is closer to 2 million people now. Franklin County just became Ohio's largest county. This growth is real. And in just 2016, this region created 25,000 jobs and built over 8,000 housing units. Don't let anybody tell you that growth isn't happening here. It's real, and I tell you, this is a region that's on the rise. And it's true, our community is changing, and it's quickly growing. And we know this from our work in Insight 2050, and I know a lot of you have been a part of that. This is a collaborative effort to get ahead of growth and changing development trends. It revealed that growth is gonna be very different than in the past. We know, too, that Central Ohio could add 300,000 jobs and up to a million people, and very significantly, our population over 65 is expected to double. And when we think about this aging, and we think about the opportunity and the challenge that it poses for our region, you know, as people age and their abilities change, 
We know that communities are going to need to provide easier access to services and amenities. Uh, but if you talk to our friends like Fran Dennis, she'll tell you this is an opportunity too because this is a huge opportunity to work with a growing population of active and talented seniors. And so we're doing something about it. And so to better prepare, uh, just last year we launched Age Friendly Columbus. And this is a, a plan where we're planning for older adults and a higher quality of life, but planning with older adults. And through this project, Columbus and Morpsey have gathered information on our aging population. We've done surveys to learn the region's strengths and weaknesses. It's all spelled out in our recently released age-friendly findings report. Uh, but what we learned was interesting because if you didn't know it, people in Columbus and Central Ohio think that this is a great place to live as you age. However, we learned that our communities and adults may not be uh, doing all they can to plan for uh, their future with regard to housing and services and of course transportation. And we learned that there's a compelling need for new investments in infrastructure and services to make our region an even better place as you age. And this is important as we grow too. And as we grow, Morpsey's services in energy continue to help our seniors prepare for change just like they're helping to prepare all of our community members who struggle with change, especially by repairing their homes, making their homes safer, and reducing their utility bills with our weatherization and home repair services. We've done this in thousands of homes just in Franklin County alone for over 30 years, thanks to our really strong partners on the screen. What you need to know is our work in energy is not just about energy efficiency. This is about making our region more competitive by reducing poverty, by reducing the burden of home energy costs on our workforce, we're becoming a more competitive region. And we know that it's important to compete as a region, not just by doing these things, but it's vital to also connect all of our innovations to every neighborhood and every county in Central Ohio. You see, our philosophy at Morpsey is to get ahead of growth, we don't all need to grow the same way, but we do all need to be strategic and working together. And I want to give you a great example of that. So uh, this past year, we launched a new initiative to provide transportation planning tools to seven rural counties in central Ohio. Uh, thanks to uh, folks like our good friend Union County Commissioner Steve Stolte and others, for the first time, nearly every part of our region has access to transportation tools, uh, advanced ones to help plan for our network for the future and for new technology. This is a big regional move for uh, all of central Ohio. We also need to know our priorities as a region, and if you talk to our friends at Columbus 2020, we've partnered with them to identify our priority infrastructure projects. This is called Competitive Advantage Initiative, and let's make it simple. This is gonna position Central Ohio to be a region that's ready to move forward on infrastructure. This is a regional process of local government officials, economic development officials in 13 counties from Franklin and Delaware on off to Perry and others who are all working together to prioritize their shovel-ready projects. And what Morps is gonna do that's different is we're gonna take it a step further by dedicating a team member whose job it is to go after funding for those projects and to monitor those projects so that we can make sure whether it's transportation, technology, or energy, Central Ohio is gonna be more assertive than ever in going after the infrastructure to position us for the future. And you know that one of Morpsey's core roles is to do just that. And that's why next month our board members expect to adopt a new $2 billion, $2 billion transportation improvement program for Central Ohio to position us uh, in our transportation network to be smarter for the future. And you know very well, if you've been in Central Ohio at all over the last year, that our region is focused on smart mobility. Thanks to Mayor Ginther and his team's efforts, we are the winner of the Smart City competition, and Smart Columbus has kicked off a new era of transportation innovation. And this is exciting. It's building off of impressive as assets that we already have in the region, like Ohio State's Smart Mobility Initiative, the Transportation Research Center, and more. And I could go on, but the initiative, you need to know this, the initiative has already turned $40 million into over $400 million of public and private investment. That deserves a round of applause. And I, I know that our partners at Smart Columbus that say they're just getting started too. 
It's also spurring new efforts around the region, like the Northwest 33 Innovation Corridor, where state and local partners are implementing today's, or, uh, tomorrow's technologies today, things like truck platooning and other. This change is coming, and we are leading the way. We know that Central Ohio's role as a smart region is just beginning, but it's even more meaningful because these efforts are not just about high tech. The focus is on connecting innovations to every neighborhood and every county that need it the most and that can benefit from the most to solve problems in our community. And a lot of us are very personally motivated by this and so invested in this. I'm so proud of the strategy that our region has taken on smart technology. You know, it also is driving logistics too. And we know that uh, smart innovation and logistics are one of Central Ohio's largest economic clusters. We know the jobs and investments we have at Rickenbacker are crucial to our region's prosperity. And we know we need to continue to invest here and leverage the connections we've created for businesses. And that's why Morpsey is working with over a dozen community partners on the Rickenbacker area study. This is gonna support the growth and investment strategy of our friends at the Columbus Regional Airport Authority and Elaine and her team's vision, as well as a number of community partners around that facility. Combined with Smart Columbus, this could have major results for our economy. And it's true, we're leading on te uh, transportation technology. Uh, that's what uh, we're doing as a smart region and a smart city. Uh, but we're even leaning on potentially game-changing technology like Hyperloop. And this is amazing. If you haven't heard, it's a new proposed mode of transportation to move people and freight up to 700 miles an hour. It's designed to be efficient and affordable. And we think that a smart region like ours should be competing for it. And that's why Morpsey and Columbus Partnership proposed a link between Pittsburgh, Columbus, and Chicago called Midwest Connect. The Hyperloop Global One Challenge uh, was a global competition to look for corridors of interest. And guess what? We're one of 35 semifinalists out of 2,600 globally. Just imagine how, oh yeah, we should clap for that. We need to be raising our hand for these technologies and saying they should be in Central Ohio first. We should not be afraid to do so. Because imagine how transformative 20 minute travel times to Chicago could be for our region. So we're gonna prepare for that next phase of the competition. So please get that support letter in and we'll keep you updated. You know, one of the things I love most about Central Ohio is we're very quick to celebrate our successes but we believe that our best days are still ahead of us. We're not afraid to talk honestly about our challenges and we value how growth and innovation and technology can play a role. And I wanna highlight how I think transportation is a perfect example of what's going on. And so perhaps to the surprise of anybody who is stuck in traffic this morning, um, I've got the data to prove it. Central Ohio rates is one of the lowest places for traffic congestion in the country. And so we've done a good job planning for our growth, and you might be tempted to think, maybe we can rest easy. And actually, I think we have a lot of work to do. We know that from Insight 2050, that our quick growth and changing development points clearly, it points clearly to us to need to seriously consider new options for high capacity transit. And Morpsey studies have revealed some other important gaps that we want to focus on too. And for example, thousands of jobs go unfilled at major centers like Rickenbacker due to the transportation disconnect between workforce housing and employment location. This is a big issue for our region. Morpsey, Coda, and communities like Groveport and New Albany and others are testing new solutions to fix this with shuttle services and other approaches. But more needs to be done, and we need your community and your businesses to work with us to try to solve this big disconnect. You know, even in the hottest development area in the region, downtown Columbus, buildings are unfilled due to transportation challenges from not enough parking or robust transit options. Public and private partners said that's not good enough, and thanks to folks like Cleaver Exeker and his leadership worked with Morpsey, Coda and the Special Improvement District and the property owners downtown on a pilot. Get this, it's gonna figure out how to give 43,000 downtown employees a Coda pass. And that could be transformative. This could be a national model if we could use, it's hard work, it took well over a year for them to get this together. We could use transit 
to fill office spaces and reduce the parking shortage downtown, all without building another garage. That could be amazing, and we're really proud of that work that's being done. You know, we've also studied our region's bike infrastructure, and this is important. It underserves low-income communities, minority communities, and especially our rural communities. And this all comes at a time when usage of our trails is soaring. And even though we have over 200 miles of trails, there's significant demand for more trails and better connections in every neighborhood and every county. The Central Ohio Greenways Board and our friends uh, Tony Collins and others have a vision to fill these gaps and do this across the region. If you haven't already, we need you, we need your community to support Morpsey and the COGS efforts to help extend this network to neighborhoods and counties and fill these gaps. And on a very serious note, despite everybody's best efforts, traffic injuries and fatalities are still rising. Over 14,000 injuries and 122 deaths in just 2016. We all have to do more. We can't accept 122 deaths as normal. We've had 17 already this year. That's why I'm, I'm proud to share that our Morpsey team and our commission just last week at our board meeting adopted a new initiative with the Ohio Department of Transportation to test out and pilot new approaches and new safety ideas and implement them across the region. This is gonna save lives. It's just a beginning step, um, but we need you to be involved and we need you to support this life-saving effort. There's so much more work to be done. And I could go on and on, if you know me, but let me be direct. Uh, with your involvement and your ideas, we know that we can overcome some of our most difficult uh, challenges, especially in transportation. Uh, from 43,000 bus passes to saving lives to smart Columbus uh, to jobs at Rickenbacker, this is, these are tough problems and we're working to solve them. And I want you to know that Morpsey's gonna be ready to be a catalyst for you to get things done. We did this by starting a conversation in March called Purpose Region, where we talked to over 100 community leaders and asked them for our, their ideas on these, these issues. It was an action-packed, inspiring day. You're gonna hear about it later in the program. But conversation is just one part of the answer. To do it right, we know we need to invest in smart technologies, but also in new data strategies for Central Ohio. We need to be smart and objective about our problems, and that's why Morpsey's placed this front and center to leverage our data expertise in new ways. And that's what today's all about. We're gonna highlight this today. You're gonna to hear bold new approaches from Boston and around the country. You're even gonna meet our new data director who brings innovations from his work with community foundations across the country. Uh, I'm excited to share the panel with you today. So let's get started. Thank you for being part of Morpsey's 2017 start, uh, State of the Region. Today only happens with you, with your support, and especially National Church Residences and our other generous sponsors listed in your program. Let's thank all of you and our sponsors for today's event. And if you didn't already know it, Morpsey's fortunate to have one of the region's most innovative, respected public administrators as our board chair. Uh, he's a great mentor, he's a great friend, he has an awesome sense of humor, if you know him. He deadpans like nobody else. And he's a great resource to all of us in Central Ohio. Let's welcome Worthington City Manager and Morpsey Chair Matt Greeson. Thank you for your opening remarks and for firing us up, William. Uh, if you don't know it, there is nobody working harder or more enthusiastically to advance Central Ohio than our own William Murdoch. Let's give him a round of applause. I'm, I'm honored to address you today as Morpsey's board chair. I'm once again heartened uh, by the diverse group of leaders who have gathered here today. We are very, very thankful for your support. As you heard, Morpsey is involved in incredible and exciting initiatives, from making us an age-friendly region to Hyperloop, smart technology and transportation innovation, bike and pedestrian planning and energy efficiency. This is what 
MORPC and your region is doing to prepare for the future. You heard and will continue to hear today why. Because we are growing, because we have great opportunities, and yes, because we also have some real social challenges. And you are hearing how. We are using technology, data, sophisticated scenario modeling, dialogue and collaboration to move things forward. But I also hope you heard something else, that there are some timeless, good public policy and governance principles. Maybe you could say values of a good and functioning local democracy that underpin who Morpsey is. Through dialogue, openness, involvement, we seek to discern, not assume, the public good. We are honest about our challenges and opportunities, and we seek to take them head on. We use collaborative processes to reconcile differences, differences in perspective, position, and priority. And we seek to support, serve, and connect citizens who are underserved. And through all of this, we try and want to earn our members and your trust. So my involvement has led me to believe that Morpsey is a unique civic platform. For all of us, and I mean all of us, to engage on the broad array of interconnected issues that impact our region. And William described many of these. The sophisticated future growth scenario modeling Morpsey did with Insight 2050 and the ongoing data and planning efforts underway are helping us find more sustainable and innovative ways to position our region for long-term success. See, we know that these inner issues are interwoven and that our communities and our citizens are interdependent. Access to an array of transportation alternatives in one area of our region can connect a person with a job, health and social services, and educational opportunities in another part. And this creates a multitude of beneficial outcomes. Data and information can foster better decision making <clears throat> and more effective local governance. Reducing energy costs in a low income household. It saves them money and it positively impacts the environment for everyone. But these things don't happen by chance. There has to be an organization. There has to be a platform, a place. One of my friends calls them a, mediati a mediating institution, somebody that facilitates our conversation, that helps us focus across our communities and organizations on how we make strides in all of these areas we've discussed. And for many of us, that is Morpsey. As community leaders, Morpsey members, we rely on Morpsey to help us plan, to help us innovate, and to help us achieve our goals. We could not do this without the super talented group of staff at Morpsey. They are working every day to strengthen our region through collaborative initiatives and programs. William highlighted a lot of things Morpsey is doing, but I have to tell you, they are doing even more. They created an Insight 2050 technical assistance program recently to help communities analyze sites and corridors. They are launching a local government energy partnership which provides resources and tools to reduce energy consumption. They're working on the Franklin County Energy Study, examining existing energy supply and consumption across transportation, commercial, industrial, and residential users. There is nobody more passionate about the future of Central Ohio working more creatively to service across so many issues than the staff of Morpsey. Can we all give them a round of applause for their work? We also have a large and diverse and very active board representing over 60 member local governments and regional agencies. Our board members represent dense urban areas, rural agricultural communities, 
fast growing as well as inner ring suburbs and communities with every demographic, every socioeconomic condition and history. All are dedicated officials who work not only in their local communities, but they really put aside parochial interests and work for the benefit of all of Central Ohio when they come to Morpsey. As a board, we want Morpsey to be a catalyst. We want to foster, inform, and host serious conversations and planning about how we advance our region. And we want to harness our region's incredible collaborative spirit to get things done in the present, for the future, and in service to the common good. Will you join me in recognizing and thanking our Morpsey board members for their work? I appreciate the opportunity to share these remarks with you today. And at this time, I would like William Murdoch, our executive director, and our elected officers to join me on the stage. Vice Chair Rory McGinnis from the City of Columbus and Secretary Karen Angelou from the City of Gahanna. These are two extraordinarily dedicated public servants and we are fortunate to have these leaders also helping guide our regional efforts. Thank you very much. The first of our three distinguished awards to be presented is the Regional Leadership Award. The Regional Leadership Award recognizes people in our 15-county region who make extraordinary efforts for the future of our communities. This award represents Morpsey's dedication to addressing issues that go beyond community boundaries and that embrace visionary thinking. Before we announce this year's winner of the Regional Leadership Award, Let's recognize all of our outstanding nominees on the screen. Please join me in recognizing these nominees. This year's winner is Patrick Lazinski, CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Library. Mr. Lazinski, will you please join us on stage to accept this award? Since 2002, when he became the CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Library, Pat Lazinski has been a driving force in the region. By using innovative ways to inspire reading, sharing resources, and connecting people to their community library, Pat has ensured that the library continues to be a critical community asset in the 21st century and beyond. In the past year, his extraordinary efforts have solidified the future viability of Central Ohio and its communities by bringing state-of-the-art libraries to the region. Under Pat's leadership, the Columbus Metropolitan Library has reinvented itself through its 2020 vision plan. An ambitious $135 million capital improvement program currently underway. This initiative touches 10 library locations throughout Central Ohio. While the space for books is still a need, Pat acknowledges that the library usage has changed and that there is also a need for study space, college instruction space, GED preparation, tutoring, literacy classes, and technology. The Columbus Metropolitan Library's investment in new libraries enables them to be direct community partners in initiatives that improve literacy and promote lifelong learning. Through these new branches, the library is better equipped to serve customers throughout the region from all walks of life. Pat recognizes the importance of planning for Central Ohio's future and the future of the communities the Columbus Metropolitan Library serves. The new construction, openness, and accessibility of the libraries allows people to feel welcome and have a sense of pride in their communities. His hope is to bring inspiration to these communities, both inside and out because building great libraries is a pivotal step in building great communities. Pat Lazinski's forward-thinking leadership has set our communities up for success, and we thank him for that. Thank you, Pat. Thank, thank you, Pat. Pat. Gracias, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat.
Congratulations and thank you, Pat, for all you do for Central Ohio. Our next award is the William H. Anderson Excellence in Public Service Award. This award recognizes a past or present board member who has made a really significant contribution to Morpsey, the community and our region. If you don't know, William H. Anderson was a longtime Morpsey board member. He was the epitome of a civic volunteer and is remembered for his zeal with which he championed Morpsey's mission and goals. And the person we're gonna give this award today uh, embodies all of those values. And so it is my pleasure uh, to announce the winner, our own Karen Angelou, Gahanna City Council member. Karen Angelou has dedicated her life to serving others and advocating for greatness by giving back to her community. She launched a professional career in teaching through utilizing her natural gifts and musical talent to inspire students with developmental disabilities to achieve their greatest potential. This led to her leadership in managing a housing program to assist adults with disabilities. Karen continued to pursue broader community leadership and joined the Gahanna City Council in 1981. She accepted leadership roles, including a term as council president. Through establishing a vision for the city of Gahanna, Karen's work led to a strengthened local economy. In 2012, she was appointed to the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission and immediately took on the challenges of the Executive Director's Search Committee and the Boundaries Task Force. Her active leadership led to her successful nomination in 2014 to the Executive Committee where she currently serves as an officer. Karen is deserving of this award because she is the board member that does anything and everything that's asked of her and she does it better than anybody could do it. Karen has been a great participant in this Morpsey region and we're very, very lucky to have her serving the role, especially in areas of sustainability and public policy. Karen was really instrumental in helping to select an air quality consultant for Morpsey's air quality program. Her experiences at Morpsey have really shown her greater understanding of the Morpsey mission. Karen has been a steadfast supporter of Central Ohio, as well as a supporter of Morpsey. She has been a great leader, not afraid to take on difficult tasks or ask the hard questions. Karen's been a friend and a mentor of mine from Gehanna to my time at Morpsey. What I see in Karen is someone who embodies the definition of public service and leadership. It's who she is, it's in her heart. Whether she's working with our committees or our staff or advancing us forward, she's always listening and trying to make Central Ohio a better place. I just might cry, <laughs> uh, but I am incredibly blessed to be part of the Morpsey team. I want to thank and thank my uh, Morpsey colleagues for the honor of being nominated and selected for this award. Please know your confidence is greatly appreciated, and I will cherish this moment forever. Well, thank you, and very honestly, I have another honor of presenting our final award, the William C. Habig Collaborative Award. This honor represents outstanding efforts and innovation in creating partnerships and sharing resources. This award captures the dedication to collaboration of Bill Habig. Bill served as Morpsey's executive director for over 30 years, and today he continues to serve the region as a current Morpsey board member, representing the community of Granville Township. Let's take a moment to congratulate all of our nominees for this collaborative award. And this year's award goes to Smart Columbus. I would like to invite all the representatives of Smart Columbus Project to the stage. 
The City of Columbus won the U.S. Department of Transportation's $40 million Smart City Challenge in June of 2016, after competing against nearly 80 cities nationwide to become the country's first city to fully integrate innovative technologies, self-driving cars, connected vehicles, and smart sensors into their transportation network. Columbus was also awarded an additional $10 million grant from Paul G. Allen's Vulcan Inc. to accelerate the transition to an electrified, low emissions transportation system. The federal government put a challenge out there. What they're looking for are innovative solutions that have never been tried before and integrate this internet of things that is creating systems that are solving issues in other people's lives. Smart Columbus really highlights the Columbus way and that's our collaboration. The great part about the Smart City Award is it brought together all of the Columbus partners. Quite frankly, it was an unprecedented collaboration between an incredibly diverse group that I don't think had ever been brought together before in Columbus. Using our private sector, our public sector, and our neighborhoods to really look at solutions come together and Smart Columbus highlights that in a tremendous way. So when you're talking about data scientists and people who do artificial intelligence, you're putting them on a challenge of how can we take what you do and apply it to other areas in people's lives. Smart Columbus is really going to allow us to take uh, neighbors in areas like Linden and connect them where maybe they weren't able to be connected before. As one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the Midwest, Columbus is poised to lead the way in the future of transportation. Good afternoon, and uh, we are so thrilled uh, to be recognized for our community's great work around our Smart Columbus application and award. We'd like to thank William Murdoch and Morpsey and all of our Smart Columbus partners, the Columbus Partnership, the Ohio State University, American Electric Power, Battelle, Honda, Coda, Resource Emirati, Nationwide, and our great partners at Franklin County. It's been just about 10 months since we were awarded the U.S. Department of Transportation Smart Cities Grant. I believe more than ever that Columbus won out over the other 77 great American cities because we did not look at this as a way simply to move people around from point A to point B, but instead how to better the lives of the people of our city, in particular those who had been left out of the prosperity that so many of us have enjoyed. I believe that transportation is the great equalizer of the 21st century. It is the road to jobs, to education, to health care, to child care, ladders of opportunity. And the future of transportation is not simply more highways and parking lots. What we will provide with Smart Columbus is a new way of looking at infrastructure, technology, and transportation that will better the quality of life for every resident, every family, in every neighborhood. With our Smart Columbus platform, we are leading the way for Columbus, the region, the state, and the country. We are grateful for the recognition here today, and we are here to also join you in a new spirit of regionalism that I believe will shape our future as a community for decades to come. Public-private partnerships, partners from throughout this region. We had 200 letters of support for our Smart Columbus application because people in Granville understood what Smart Columbus meant to them. And the great people of Grove City understood the impact as well. That regionalism that makes our region so unique will help define us and make the future worthy of our children and grandchildren. Thanks for having us.
please welcome to the stage Virginia Barney, senior collaborator with the Collective Genius and Lillian Lowry, president and CEO of Future Ready Columbus. We didn't know what to expect when 100 bold leaders from across central Ohio devoted a day to come together to think about what kind of place do we want our region to be? What kind of community do we want to leave our children and our children's children? We're going to share some of our findings. Inspired by Aaron Hurst's book, The Purpose Economy, planning and design firm NBBJ invited Morpsey to join them in creating a purpose region workshop. The two entities match subject matter experts with experienced facilitators in a perfect backdrop to foster creative thinking. The Reeb Center, known for building self-sufficiency and transforming lives in a community, was selected. Firestarter speakers provided inspirational stories to start the day. William Murdoch shared data projections. A million more people will be entering our region with a widening array of cultural diversity and personal preferences impacting every industry. Simultaneous, we learned that uh, people want to live in aspirational communities that enrich the human experience. What is the purpose of our region? We broke into four focus groups. We examined affordable housing, we discovered there's no simple solution, but there is a role for everyone in addressing the issue. The facts, over 200,000 Central Ohioans live in poverty. Our poverty rate is three times the rate of the overall population and has increased in the suburbs. 54,000 Central Ohioans spend half their income on housing. Rents are going up at twice the pace of income. When we drill down into the facts, nine of the top 10 occupations in the Columbus region with the most annual openings don't pay workers enough to afford housing. We identified the questions we need to answer, such as what is our commitment to mixed income neighborhoods? Another group focused on health and well-being. How can we design a healthy, vibrant purpose region for all ages? We discovered that the heart of our region is less healthy than the nation as a whole in percentage of overweight children, infant mortality, food insecurity, and emergency room visits. We recommend addressing the social factors that impact health by providing better access to preventative health care, fresh food, and recreation. Creating options for transportation and mixed-use communities can help improve lives. Environment and sustainability was another focus. The top issues which surfaced were social inequality, land use, alternative transportation, and long-term planning. Mechanisms for change are extensive and will require regional collaboration, something we are already fostering. Range of solutions include building multimodal transportation to connect jobs, housing, and open space. Key to help shift the culture is a better educated citizenry. Our fourth group then was focused on workforce development and education. Five top issues center on the inequities. Only 54% of our future workforce is expected to be prepared for the economic opportunities available in 2025. Mechanisms for change cross all industries and include items like empowering people to be civically engaged, better childcare, rehabilitation training in prisons, and reintegration into society, and mental health. In conclusion, 
A purpose region is a caring community that pursues equity, appreciates diversity, and creates multiple pathways to earn a living. It is where the value and potential of everyone is realized. It is where the life cycle of opportunities for earning and learning are continuous. It is where lives are enriched and live to the fullest. Let us all be inspired by these 100 leaders and work to carry out these visions. Thank you. There's a perfect storm of an increasing population of seniors and the availability of affordable housing. National Church Residences has a dedicated and proven track record in providing housing options, health care, and supportive services to more than 42,000 seniors. Originating from a Christian commitment of service, our mission is to provide high-quality care, support, and residential communities for all seniors. With 340 communities in 28 states and Puerto Rico, National Church Residences is the nation's largest not-for-profit provider of affordable senior housing and the largest employer of service coordinators. Guided by our core values, our promise is to provide excellence in all we do in order to transform lives. At National Church Residences, we have a vision of advancing better living for all seniors to live healthier and more satisfying lives, enabling them to remain home for life. Learn more about us at nationalchurchresidences.org. It's a big crowd. I feel like you're all family. Incredible to think about National Church Residences and our mission. We serve 42,000 seniors every day, but none more than in the Central Ohio region. Virtually every neighborhood represented by a round table has a National Church Residences community in your presence. Our first one actually was in Gahanna. Uh, for the folks here from Gahanna and our friends, I'm thrilled to see uh, that community get an award and you, uh, Ms. Angelou, it's great. I wanted you to know that uh, we are headquartered here in Columbus. We have 3,200 staff here, and we have a vision for advancing better living for seniors to enable seniors to remain home for life. As I make an emphasis there, I think we're known as a real estate organization building communities, and we have a lot of communities. I, I was just writing down the communities right here in central Ohio, from Grandview to Upper Arlington, Columbus, of course, Hilliard, Lancaster, Worthington, Dublin, Delaware, Whitehall, Johnstown, and our newest community be opening in Westerville here uh, this summer. We offer communities with assisted living services, with uh, memory support. We offer skilled nursing, home and community-based services of all types. Why? You've heard the statistic that 10,000 seniors turn 65 every day, and that only has impact when you start multiplying. That's 365 days a year for 19 years. That's 54 million people. I'm one of them that's going to turn 65 in the next 19 years. Six, that's 54 million. Today we only have 40. That's more than double the number of people. Many times you think of that as being an older population. I don't want to consider myself old, and I am part of that mix. Anybody here that's between the age of 52 and 69, you're part of the problem or part part of the solution as we talk about age-friendly Columbus. When uh, William Murdoch called us and asked us to be a sponsor, we said we're all about making Columbus and the region age-friendly. Anything we can do, and that's our mission. Our vision is to advance better living for seniors. So William, we're all in. We have a home and community-based service uh, challenge ahead of us as we think about the aging population because we can't build everybody a senior community. Lord knows we would try. So we think about at-home personal care, home health, hospice, adult daycare. We want to serve every senior in that setting that we can. But I will tell you that many of our homes where seniors live today lack the structural features and the support that can make their living independently safe and realistic at home. There's a, lot, there's a study that came out from D.C., the Bipartisan Policy Council, that noted that the existing and emerging healthcare technology will be key to allowing older seniors to stay home. That's me too, if you think about it, just add 19 years, we're all there, the, us baby boomers. That could include fall monitoring systems, medicating management tools, uh, social networking to ease isolation and depression. But despite this effort, this growing interest in using technology to help older adults, many 
barriers stand in the way. Limited internet access is among them, particularly in rural areas and among the low-income housing for seniors. That's why I'm glad to be here introducing Anne. Ann Schwigger, she works for the city of Boston. What a cool city. She works in their Department of Innovation and Technology as broadband and digital equity advocate. In this role, she supports the city of Boston in advancing access to affordable broadband connectivity, up-to-date digital tools and digital skills that Bostonians need. Obtaining this access will allow Bostonian residents uh, including older adults, to engage in the educational, economic, and civic pursuits critical to their future, as well as the lives of families and communities. Anne also serves on the City of Cambridge Broadband Task Force and is the producer of a community television show of Cambridge Broadband Matters. She holds a Master in City Planning from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT and a bachelor's from bi in biology and society from Cornell. Those are two very cool places. Please join me in welcoming Ann Schwigger. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Ann Schwigger, as Mark shared. I am the broadband and digital equity advocate for the city of Boston in the Department of Innovation and Technology. Um, it is an incredible honor to join you here today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share about the important intersection of local government, broadband, and digital equity. I'm excited to talk about the work that the City of Boston is doing in this space. Thank you very much to the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, particularly Bernice Cage. Uh, where is Bernice? Um, please give Bernice a round of applause. Uh, Bernice has been incredibly kind, welcoming, generous, and supportive um, in preparation for this day. Um, and I'm very, I feel very fortunate that I uh, had the opportunity to get to know Bernice and many other members of the MORPC team during this process. Uh, thank you to Angela Seifer um, of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. You and the NDI team help practitioners, policy advocates, and local government folks from all across the country to learn with and from one another. You have catalyzed new partnerships and on a daily basis demonstrate that now is the time to work on digital inclusion. You help us to see that there are things we can all do in service of the same. Now before we jump in, I was told by Karen that I should mention that this is the second time I've uh, been in the central Ohio area. Um, the first time was in ninth grade, which I think was 1997. Um, I came here to play in the Pickerington Lady Tiger Holiday Classic. Pickerington is here today. Uh, would you mind waving? All right, I don't, oh, there you are. Well, thank you, I, I felt welcome then. I feel welcome now. This is an incredible place to be, um, so thank you. All right, so let's get to it. Um, I think a good place for us to start today in our exploration of broadband and digital equity in local government is to take a look at how we are thinking about equity. We think of equity as the condition that results when civil society and government act to protect and affirm the rights of all people and ensure that everyone has an equal voice as we work together to evolve these important institutions to meet all of our needs now and in the future. Digital equity is equal access to the digital skills, digital tools, and internet connectivity that we need to pursue our activities of daily living, as well as the goals we hold as individuals, as members of families, and as members of communities. Digital equity is simultaneously a precondition and means by which we achieve equity. Broadband is the inter internet connectivity piece of this. In the absence of broadband, Students can't do homework, people can't apply for jobs, businesses cannot start, let alone grow, technological and civic innovation would crawl to a halt. It is clear that broadband and digital equity is important to forward motion as communities and as society. Now from a local government perspective, we view broadband and digital equity as foundational to everything we care about. 
We have the buy-in among local leaders in Boston that now is the time for action. I should also start advancing my slides. So we did the thank yous. Thank you for bearing with me. I was clearly a little nervous as a ninth grader playing in front of uh, Pat Summit, oddly enough, and a little nervous now speaking in front of you all. But once again, I feel welcome, so it's going great. So we did the civil society and government and equity. All right, so we know this is important. We are so fortunate in Boston to have a high level buy-in from our elected officials. And uh, actually, many communities across the country are working hard on this. Um, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance tracks the, the activities of, of local communities across the country. And you can see here on their list of trailblazers, um, investment in staff time and specific roles focused on digital inclusion are a critical area of investment. In Boston, we created the role of broadband and digital equity advocate in 2015. As you can see here, broadband and digital equity is one of the five core areas of focus within the Department of Innovation and Technology. Broadband and digital equity and the principles we hold dear also infuse the long-term planning processes that we are involved with in the city. You also find these principles infused in the day-to-day -day workflows across departments, from public works to the elderly commission. You will find broadband and digital equity front and center. One area of focus is household broadband adoption. In Boston, approximately one in five households do not subscribe to broadband in the home. Now this does not mean that they don't have any internet access at all. Smartphones have taken on an incredibly important role and we also know that libraries and community centers in Boston and in communities across the country are an incredibly important access point for many community members. What this roughly one in five does tell us though is that many residents have unequal access at a point in time when access is non-negotiable. We all need it to fulfill our, our responsibilities and to be a great society. Thankfully, Boston is home to many organizations who promote access to digital skills, learning opportunities, digital tools acquisition, and also act as an important on-ramp for many community members to broadband adoption. One important thing for everyone to know, and many of you already know this, is that broadband and digital equity is an incredible learning opportunity across communities. We all embrace the opportunity to help one another from Boston to Columbus to Pinkerton to Seattle to Austin. Uh, we love working together. Starting this year, uh, we will follow the lead of communities such as Seattle and Austin and will begin to do digital equity grant making to local organizations. We will also follow the lead of rural, suburban, and urban areas alike and start doing Wi-Fi hotspot lending through our Boston Public Library. Outside of access to broadband in the home, we believe that robust connectivity is also critical in the places where people work, learn, play, and engage in civic life. It is for this reason that the city is investing in the expansion of fiber to each Boston public school and is also continuing to roll out free public Wi-Fi across each of Boston's Main Street's districts. Now let's loop back for a minute on adoption. One of the reasons we have an adoption gap is because many households cannot afford this critical service. We can trace a portion of this affordability gap to market failure. This market failure has created monopoly or near monopoly conditions in much of the United States. In Boston, it was the case for some time that 90% of households had a single option for internet service. So in addition to working hard on digital skills, digital tools, and home broadband ad adoption, we need to fix the parts of our broadband ecosystem that are broken. So now we see a wrinkle. We can't just do one thing at, the, at once, not even two things at once. This is so important. We also need to acknowledge a few more things about broadband and digital equity in communities. It's very interconnected. You have infrastructure, technology, public and private institutions, people, and markets. Because it is comprised of these interconnected things, it is constantly evolving. Our work will probably never be done.
Because this is about technology, people, and the way that people use technology, this will be in flux forever. This is the primary reason why the city of Boston and other cities across the country are creating permanent roles, such as the one I am fortunate to hold. Now, let's dig a little deeper into the question of why city government? Well, as we've discussed, broadband and digital equity are foundational to all we hold dear, and we can't get where we say we want to go without it. It is so important that we cannot afford to sit back, wait it out, and hope it resolves itself. We need to jump in and take action. In addition, and this is very exciting, and I know we have some local government buffs, including at this table right here, um, local government is full of the things we need to get the job done. We have tools, processes, various types of levers, and importantly, talented, committed, committed people. If we leverage all of these things, we can make incredible things happen. So all of this amounts to why Boston is taking a systems approach to resolving our broadband and digital equity challenges. Uh, it, this is a, a building foundation. Um, if we, we really see what we're doing as like laying the foundation for durable solutions that stick and continue to evolve in ways that meet constituents' needs and set them up for success. Here are some of the things we are focused on and that we think will help us accomplish all of this. So thankfully, this is not an actual city government process, but I would venture to guess that some of us can feel like this is what we put people through. Um, so we see the things that we are already doing day to day as great opportunities to achieve new goals. This doesn't require a new program or even new money. If we can enhance or otherwise tweak processes and permitting associated with investment in broadband infrastructure, we can make incredible gains. Improving all of this is itself a goal we share across many departments in the city and also infuses the areas of work which we will explore next. All right, so making sure that the built environment of our communities are broadband ready has always been a good idea. However, for communities that are experiencing significant growth, such as Central Ohio and Boston, um, now is the time to really get this right. We know that to accommodate the growth we expect in Boston by 2030, we need to add 53,000 new units of housing. The process of adding these units creating commercial development, and renovating existing building stock is a perfect opportunity to get broadband right. By making sure that our buildings and the right of way that runs around them are planned in a future looking way, we can decrease the cost of deployment, make sure that we are expanding choice and competition for all of our residents and businesses for years to come. Now, I think this is one of my favorite public processes to say. I will now talk about the Article 80 design review process of the Boston Planning and Development Agency and our work on this to do make changes to their project notification form. You're welcome, local government people. All right. So we undertook a very exciting um, body of work with our colleagues at the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Our goal in this was for new developments to be asked questions before a single shovel goes in the ground about what their intentions are to make their developments broadband ready. We worked on this with a company called Wired Score to infuse our existing building design review process with their best in class broadband criteria. Now, when developers begin having dialogue with the Boston Planning and Development Agency, way up top, at the beginning of the process, they will be asked questions about things like point of entry planning from the right of way to the building, the capacity of telco closets in the building to accommodate multiple providers, the ability of inside wiring to be, uh, to be shared among providers, and whether or not local providers have indicated that they intend to serve the building. City-owned assets. Now, the availability of city-owned assets can be very important to the deployment of broadband infrastructure. 
We have an asset in Boston called city-owned shadow conduit. We believe this holds incredible potential to decrease the cost of deployment and hopefully help more providers serve more parts of the city. So what is shadow conduit? Where does it come from? All right, so in the mid 90s, a great policy was put in place called the Joint Build Ordinance. A component of this policy goes something like this. If you are installing your own conduit in the public right of way, while you are doing this, please install a stretch of equal length for the city. So thanks to this policy, um, the city now holds 175 miles of shadow conduit across each of our neighborhoods. So I will admit though, that this conduit has not been heavily used to date. We are undertaking some work in the coming months to look very closely at our pricing structure, how we lease the conduit, and how we go about you know, administratively doing this. Um, this is another example of how in enhancing something we already do can help us achieve our goals related to broadband and digital equity. Okay, the public right of way. I will just read this verbatim because I believe it is so important. The public right of way exists to serve the public. This is a shared public asset and should be used to create value for all of our constituents. Local government has the responsibility to ensure that the right of way is used for the state of the art and that the public derives value from this. Local control is incredibly important to this. We take this very seriously. And I know that this is a very uh, top of mind issue in Ohio right now with regard to the installation of DAS and small cell equipment in your public right of way. We would be happy to talk with you at greater length about how we see this issue. I will say again that local control is incredibly important to us. Also very relevant to the public right of way is all that is happening right now with smart cities. So my colleagues in the city's mayor's office of new urban mechanics drafted something called the Smart Cities Playbook. The playbook book serves as an important internal guide that helps us as public servants be effective stewards of the public right of way. This is particularly important as we move into an era of smart cities, which from a very practical standpoint means putting things in the public right of way, doing things with the public right of way that we weren't doing before. It was really good that we created this playbook and made our principles very clear internally, as well to those who seek to partner with us. We released a request for ideas in December, calling for smart cities ideas that could be uh, great in Boston. It turns out we received a lot of ideas, over 100 in fact. Having a set of shared principles in place beforehand allowed us to not focus on whether or not the ideas under consideration are great, but whether or not they would be great for Boston and deliver value to our constituents. Here are some of our constituents. Local government is profoundly pro-constituent. Our constituents are also consumers. With that said, it is logical, we believe, that if we are pro-constituent, we also need to be pro-consumer. So where is this going? Okay. It is not enough from our perspective to just invest in broadband infrastructure. It is not enough for our residents to be able to use broadband. We want them to use broadband in a regulatory environment that protects the free and open internet, that safeguards their privacy, and that advances affordability. On that note, uh, I would like to close um, and thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm very excited now to uh, join uh, William, Angela, and Aaron on a panel.
Well, Anne, thank you so much uh, for being in Columbus, and hopefully your second visit is just as enjoyable as your visit to Pickering Team the first time. Let's thank Anne for that very powerful message about what's happening in Boston. So during the last portion of our event, we're gonna have a panel discussion about this, so I wanna invite two experts to the stage to join Anne. First, Angela Seifer, uh, from the director, she's the director of the National Digital Inclu Inclusion Alliance, and Aaron Schill, the new director at Morpsey for Regional Data and Mapping. Angela brings a unified voice for local technology training, home broadband access, and public broadband access programs. She's worked on digital inclusion issues with local community organizations, the National Telecommunications Information Administration, state governments, and the schools, health, and libraries broadband coalition, and she's based right here in Central Ohio in Bexley. And Aaron is returning to Central Ohio from New York City, where he is the director of the Community Foundation Insights and Knowledge Services at the Foundation Center. And if you don't know about the Foundation Center, they're the leading source of data and knowledge about philanthropic entities around the world. Before that, she was the Director of Data Services at Community Research Partners, and a non, which is a nonprofit research center that we partner with in Columbus, who strengthen communities through data information and knowledge. He's also a graduate of The Ohio State University Knowlton School of Architecture and Planning. I'm an alumnus, I gotta get that in. And I am really pleased to have this panel for you today. Let's welcome the panel to the stage one more time. So my first question goes to Ann. You don't get a break. Sure. We're gonna start with you. Um, so you mentioned this job that you have in Boston. How did Boston create this position again and what made you interested in having a job like this? Great, so um, I think it was really the sense of urgency that Boston felt and that many cities are feeling about the need to address the issues that are holding our communities back as, as they relate to broadband. Um, I'm a planner. Um, planners are systems thinkers. Planners are people who want to um, manage change, facilitate communities in directing their own change, and to do so in a way that makes sure that change shakes out well for everybody. Um, there is no better place for a planner who cares about these things than broadband um, to affect um, the change that our communities need. Great. All right, so Angela, I. Can you tell us a little bit about what the National Digital Inclusion Alliance is and how you work with communities on these kind of issues across the country? Sure. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance uh, is a unified voice, unified voice for digital inclusion programs. And when we say digital inclusion programs, we need mean, we mean programs that are uh, helping with home broadband access, public access, digital literacy skills, and devices. We have about 200 affiliates. I think we're at 240 affiliates around the country. We're in 35 states. We got started uh, two years ago, and our home office is in Bexley, Ohio, in my dining room. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And what a resource for us to have right here in, in central Ohio. That's amazing. So Aaron, um, for those of you who don't know, Aaron hasn't started with Morpsey yet. He starts in May. Um, and no, this is not his final interview. We wouldn't do that to you. Um, but we are excited uh, to have Aaron here to talk about uh, some of his expertise from across the country. So tell us a little bit about what you've done at CF Insights in New York City and other places. Yeah, so uh, the last two organizations I've been with, uh, Foundation Center and CRP, um, are both nonprofits that kind of at the core of their mission uh, are focused on uh, providing increased access to and understanding of data. Um, which is, uh, in my career as a planner, it has been kind of a, a, uh, the foundation of uh, the way that I think planning should be done and the way we should serve communities. Uh, I got a chance to meet the rest of the data and mapping team yesterday at Morpsey, and uh, I can't say how excited I am to be coming back to work with such a skilled and passionate and um, curious team, uh, curious about the data they're working with. Um, and uh, to be able to do the work that I'm really passionate about in a region I'm passionate about, uh, I feel really lucky. Great, well welcome, welcome Aaron. So let's get into the heart of the, the conversation here. So we've talked a lot today about smart technology, smart Columbus, smart region. Uh, we talked about equity. Um, we're a region that wants to be smart, but uh, Anne, in your remarks, you talked a little bit about how sometimes even smart places like Boston struggle with this. So, can, can we have it both ways? Can we be a smart region and be inclusive at the same time? I think we can. 
Um, I think it's very important as we consider any um, smart cities intervention to really think long and hard about the importance of it benefiting all of our constituents, as well as the importance of our constituents being a, pro a part of the decision-making process. Um, this is fundamentally about how they experience the city and their experience of using a public right-of-way that needs to respect everyone's uh, needs and ways of use. Um, so I think that we can have it both ways, as long as the process by which we get there um, engages the public in determining what this looks like at the end of the day. And can I say, it's been very exciting sitting in the audience and hearing multiple times today the everyone, we're doing this for everyone in our community, we're making sure that no one is left behind, which is hugely reassuring. Uh, I have not been involved in the smart uh, Columbus efforts are, and that are happening around this region and having you all already figure out about the digital inclusion piece without you know, having talked to a lot of digital inclusion folks, that's awesome, right? Um, there's, there is a concern and there are more and more cities figuring out the connection between smart cities and equity and you're already on that path. Yeah, and I, I would just say, um, you know, it's hard to overstate the excitement around the Smart Columbus initiative, um, but uh, I think the irony shouldn't be lost on us that some of the autonomous vehicles driving through neighborhoods are going to be better connected than the people living in those neighborhoods. Um, and so, you know, I think it's incumbent on us to use the experience and information that we're able to gather. And it's gonna be lots of new information and lots of new types of data um, to really learn and share those learnings uh, and do it in a way that uh, we're making sure everyone's included. So kind of on that point, let's, let's talk about data and open data and how we can access this. And I, I, there's so much information, and, and Anne, I know you talked about this. Um, uh, it's something we experience in our work at Morpsey. There's so much data. How can a regular person start to access that data, and this is for anybody on the panel, without a background in data analytics? Like, how do, how do regular people access this information? So I think there are, um... There are some resources that are really good examples, uh, and I'll point out two. Uh, Open Data NYC uh, is New York City's open data uh, resource, and uh, the city of Las Vegas has a really great open data site also. And uh, you know, I won't get into detail about what's on the sites, but uh, when you go visit there for the first time, you see on the homepage uh, just some really intuitive instructions and guidance, uh, depending on what type of user you might be. So when you get onto uh, the Open Data NYC site, uh, it says, you know, do you want to try to find uh, the, the nearest public Wi-Fi in your neighborhood? Or are you curious what that tree is out in front of your office? So it's really accessible. Um, it doesn't feel like you need to be a data expert. Uh, and then both sites uh, very clearly show um, where you should go if you're uh, looking for machine-readable data because you are an app developer and you want to create some sort of application. Or if you're a researcher and you want to download whole data sets. Uh, or if you're brand new to data and you really don't know what you're looking for or how to access it, um, both of those sites are great examples of ways uh, that they, um, you know, in a very subtle way, kind of direct you to the right place uh, for what your skill set might be and your comfort level might be. Cool. Well, and Angela, uh, how do people who don't have access to the broadband, how do communities who don't have good broadband, good broadband access uh, deal with these issues? Uh, so. There's the, the public access piece, right? And I think that's often, so there's two response often that folks think of. They think of public libraries, which are an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. There's also other public locations, often in senior housing or other low-income housing. But the, the, the home broadband piece has to be a priority, right? The data is one example of accessing that data. But think of everything else that we do with the internet on a day-to-day. -day. Do you wanna do your taxes at the library? Right? Do you want to look up your prescription at the library? Sometimes you're comfortable with that, and sometimes you're not. I did, in fact, see an Amish man doing his taxes at a coffee shop, and I thought, wow, <laughs> that's, you just do what you got to do, right? But why do we need this broadband access if everybody has a smartphone in their pocket? Tell, right. me, tell me about that. Do you, want, do you want to take that? Or do you want me? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it was... The December 2015, um, Pew put out a report that indicated that smartphone and broadband adoption are at the same level, 
broadband adoption had actually dipped slightly um, at that point in time. Um, there are, are a lot of things you can do on your smartphone. I would argue that everyone needs a smartphone. Uh, it is very challenging at this point in time for anyone to fulfill their responsibilities as a kid, let alone an adult, um, without the ability to connect, to make changes on the fly, to communicate with those who you um, are supervising and are accountable to. Um, so I would say everyone needs a smartphone. Uh, you just can't do everything you need to do on a smartphone, though. Um, smartphones typically come with data caps. Uh, it is very challenging uh, to do things like do your taxes on a smartphone, apply for college on a smartphone, uh, write a term paper on a smartphone. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an important piece, but it is not sufficient. Well, even when there are smartphones, we know this is about infrastructure, it's about equity. There's, there's big gaps around the country, and uh, Angela, I know that your organization has studied this. Tell us a little bit about, I think what you call it, digital redlining? Right, there is such a thing as digital redlining, and it gets down to an issue of competition, and Anne mentioned that in her comments, how important competition is, because competition drives down the cost. So think about the places where you don't have competition. We're most familiar with this issue in rural areas, but it also this issue also occurs in, in urban areas where if there's only one provider, in some, urban, in some rural areas that might be a satellite provider, which depending upon who you're talking to, that may not really be broadband. But in urban areas, if you have one provider and they're offering a service that's gonna cost you $60 a month or more, do you really have access to broadband, <laughs> right? If you can't afford the, the one provider that's coming in. So if there are areas where it has not been rolled out and those areas are poorer, because it's more, if it, you know, for whatever reason, the provider has chosen the wealthier areas, then that's digital redlining. And we do have it in Ohio. Okay. I know that, uh, you know, MORPC is an organization of cities, townships, counties, urban, rural, suburban. Um, and this is just a question for the whole panel on broadband or, or data. Uh, this is a particularly difficult issue in, in rural and some suburban communities. How do we get ahead of that? How do we ensure equities? Uh, woven through everything we do. You want to take I'd love you to kick that off. Uh, I think you are all, all are on a fabulous first step of that because you're drawing attention to the issue. And I have to tell you, it is super exciting to be talking about this topic in my own town, right? Because I tend, I've been telling my colleagues here, I tend to run around the country, ask me what's going on in Kansas City, right? I can tell you. Ask me what's going on in Austin, Texas, I can tell you. Did I, I haven't been engaged in Central Ohio. So the fact that you're drawing attention to it, that's awesome. And that's where those conversations get started. The, one of the first things that I can suggest that you do is figure out who's already working on digital literacy skills with the populations that are least likely to have them. Because they're the ones you need to be partnering with, and they're the ones that need support to do their work. I would say, um, you know, you have in rural areas of Central Ohio, you have the same issues, um, you have the same income issues and the same access issues as um, a lot of our lower income urban neighborhoods, um, but you don't have the same proximity to resources like libraries. Uh, it may be a 45 minute drive to get to the library. Um, so even in our poor urban neighborhoods, um, those resources are more proximate, so it's possible to reach them. So that's just an additional barrier uh, on top of um, income and access issues. Okay, so I know a lot of folks are wondering, this sounds really great. Where's the money to do it? So um, where, where do you find the money and the resources to go after this? Uh, maybe, Anne? So one of the ways uh, that we support uh, our local nonprofit community uh, that's working on digital equity is through the cable franchise fees um, that we collect from uh, companies providing broadband and cable service in Boston. Um, the uh, revenue that we bring in from people utilizing the public right-of-way um, is also an important opportunity to you know, take these resources and to direct them to enable more uh, community members to use the very thing that the public right-of-way is trying to advance. Uh, so those are a couple sources. Um, yep. Another way that we've been looking at it lately is who, who are the like, government agencies and also companies that benefit from having more of your constituency online and having the digital literacy skills? 
So if there's a benefit to them to having that situation, might they be a partner? And we are seeing this in some places. The Dallas Federal Reserve has put out guidelines to financial institutions in their region encouraging uh, digital inclusion investment. Uh, there are, uh, there's a great study that's come out of Cleveland on the health benefits of having, of, having their, of having patients who know how to use personal health records and have home broadband and the impact that that has on cost within the health institution. And then that health institution is in fact covering costs to train people on how to use the personal health records and, ha and making sure they have home broadband. So there are partners to get there, so it's figuring out who's, who will benefit and who needs that for their own, uh, their own company's success. And I think the role of um, the philanthropic sector is interesting also. So um, the philanthropic sector is never going to be the primary funder of um, infrastructure or something like this. But um, what foundations are able to do is be a little riskier in what they try. And so they're great ways to pilot partnerships and, and new strategies um, that if they work well, then can be rolled out with partners in the private and public sector also. So the philanthropic sector can play a really important role in, uh, in testing out new ways to provide access. So we are at our last question. So if you're a Morpsey board member, you know that our meetings finish on time, always. Um, thank you, Eric Phillips, for inspiring us to do that. Um, so this, uh, but this panel is going to be available after the State of the Region. We're going to have a more focused dialogue. So if you want to stick around, we'll, we can dig in more. But so my last question is, what one piece of advice, we have all these local governments in here, one piece of advice for local governments on where they should start? And we'll start with Aaron. Sure. Uh, so collaboration uh, is kind of the name of the game at Morpsey, and it's going to be even more important, and we're going to have to look for new ways to partner um, as we start collecting larger and larger amounts of data and uh, new, new forms of data. Um, I'm really excited about the Regional uh, Data Advisory Committee uh, at Morpsey. Uh, I can't wait to, to dive in and work with that group and kind of see how that group can shape um, both our initiatives around open data, um, but potentially also be a part of the conversation about providing access, broadband access and other access um, to uh, all residents of Central Ohio. Digital inclusion programs tend to be run by community-based organizations, libraries, and local government. So determine, do you already have any of those programs taking place in your community? It's entirely possible that you do. Um, I would say, uh, you know more than you think you do. You have more at your disposal than you think you do because you have these institutions in your community. Um, then, a great thing to do, and we, we do this all the time, um, talk to people. Um, you are not alone. If, if you haven't started, um, you can start by just you know sending us an email and saying, we'd like to talk about what you're doing. Um, talk to other communities. Uh, talk to National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Talk to Next Century Cities. Um, I would also encourage folks to speak with the advocacy organizations who are working on if pro-consumer um, regulation of, the inter of internet service is also um, a high priority for you when it comes to your constituents using the internet. Um, I would also highly encourage you to speak with folks who are doing um, you know, net national level advocacy about all of this. You are in an incredible ecosystem of very supportive people and organizations, um, and we all want each other to succeed. So just start talking. Well, what a great conversation today. I want to give our panelists, Anne, Aaron, and Angela, our A-team, a round of applause. So hopefully uh, you got some insight into what the responsibility of being a smart region and there's so much more to it that we have to do to make sure that the whole region is benefiting. So uh, we look forward to working with you on that uh, in the coming year. So I have one or two last things for you. First, on your table, there should be a commuter challenge. If you haven't participated last year, um, we're gonna do this again this year. This is a fun program. It's about air quality. It's about uh, uh, reducing congestion. And it starts June 1st. Uh, if that's not enough to convince you, air quality and congestion, your business or your community, folks in your community can participate. There's a contest. So you can win prizes uh, by engaging in that. So please, please, please look at the commuter challenge and get involved. We had people from the whole region participate last year. And the very last thing, Thank you for being a part of Morpsey, for working with Morpsey and our team and supporting us. Don't hesitate to reach out. 
we're a resource for you, whether uh, you're in Delaware or Columbus or Pickerington or Perry County or I could go on. Email us, call us, let us know how we can help, how we can connect you. That's our role for you. That's what we love doing. And with that, we're concluded for the day. Have a great afternoon and thank you for being here again.